Um, so our first presenter is Rachel Suits. She works with Master Gardeners, Small Farms, and SNAP Education um, here with Oregon State University Extension, and she's in the Central Gorge region. And our second presenter will be Heather Stoven. She's also with OSU, working in Extension Horticulture, and she's focused on community horticulture and small farms in Yamhill County. Both Rachel and Heather are trained in entomology and are co-authors on an OSU Extension publication on Japanese beetles. So I'll let Rachel get started. She's gonna go ahead and share her screen. And so this is a little different from some of the other ones in our series where we're gonna have the presenters switch kind of midway through. All right, thank you, Brooke and Mark, for the introduction. I am, as said, Heather and I worked on a extension publication that went out in April about Japanese beetle in Oregon. We'll tell you a little bit about why it's a concern in our areas and tell you more about this insect. So the general outline of today is I'm gonna do a little bit of background on invasive species, then talk about the history and background of the Japanese beetle. Uh, a little bit about the characteristics and life cycle, and then I'm going to turn it over to Heather. She's going to talk about management and prevention and what is happening with Japanese beetle infestation in Portland. So non-native invasive species is an invasive species can be any kind of living organism that is not native to an ecosystem and which causes harm. They can harm the environment, the economy, or even human health. Species that grow and reproduce quickly and spread aggressively with potential to cause harm are given the label of invasive. So the Japanese beetle is considered an invasive species. And some of the other invasive species that we have here in Oregon, for example, might be Scotch broom or English ivy that, that harm the environment. Um, the brown marmored stink bug or spotted wing drosophila might affect the economy. And um, we do have some poison hemlock here that can not necessarily be harmful to humans, but are harmful and hazardous to livestock. I do want to say that there are invasive species that are native. Not all, non -nat not all invasive species are not native. For example, our western juniper are um, in central and eastern Oregon are considered an invasive species. So the spread of invasive species are spread because of global trade, like air travel, train travel, and ship travel. Um, they can be spread from wood products, from insects that get into the wood, or shipping pallets and crates around the world, ornamental plants shipped from other places, of the world, even from um, where we are to other places in the state, and pet trade. So for example, Burmese pythons can be a, are a big problem in the Everglades at the moment. Why are these important? Well, they can have an impact on many different things. For example, they can um, be aggressive into the ecosystem. They might not have natural predators already there as controls and then they can breed quickly and take over an area. So they can affect direct threats to invasive species by preying out native species and replacing them, out competing native species for food or other resources. They can cause or carry disease um, and they can prevent native species from reproducing or killing their young. Some of the indirect threats is that it can change the food web or um, by destroying or replacing native food sources. And sometimes, actually most times, the invasive species have very little to no food value in the food system. They decrease biodiversity um, by being aggressive plants. For example, the kudzu plant is, is, um, does that in the southeastern United States. And they can alter ecosystem conditions. For example, cheatgrass in the U.S. can change the chem soil chemistry um, or intensity of wild, wildfires here. Some important inv invasive insect species that we already deal with here in Oregon and other places in the United States is the spotted wing Drosophila you see on your screen on the left. 
you've got the male is on the very left with the spots and the female is on the right. You can see her strong ovipositor. So she lays eggs inside soft skin fruits like cane berries and cherries and which can have a, a huge impact on, um, on export for these goods. The brown marmorid stink bug is another one. It has a wide host range like the Japanese beetle that I'll get to in a moment. Um, and it has no natural enemies. So neither one of these, well, with the exception of the newly arri new arrival of a native parasitoid, the Trisulcus japonicus, and that's for the brown marmorid stink bug. And these are both pretty hard to manage. So the research is looking more into biological controls of these. Um, Japanese beetle is a pretty similar um, insect in that regard. So I'll launch into the Japanese beetle. This is an image of where the Japanese beetle is distributed around the United States. You'll see that it is largely in the eastern United States. Um, but there are pockets out west in Southern California, the Central California. You'll see the yellow where it's found and where it's being eradicated in the Portland area and then where it's found in Washington. And that is a direct result of the global trade because most of these are found near the ports. So here's a poll for you all out there. Where are you coming from? Are you within the Portland, Oregon, Japanese beetle quarantine area? Are you in the five county Portland metro area? Are you in Oregon, but outside the Portland area? Are you outside Oregon, but in an area with an established Japanese beetle or outside Oregon in an area without? I will hand it over to Mark, who's gonna post that yep. poll. Brooke, do you want to keep, Brooke, are you able to see them? I am. So we have 7% uh, are within the quarantine area in Portland. 42%, uh, so our, our highest amount, are in the five-county Portland metro area. Close 41% are in Oregon, but outside the Portland area. 3% are outside Oregon, but in an established uh, Japanese beetle area and 7% are outside Oregon but don't have Japanese beetle. All right, thank you. All right, so those of you that are in number two, the five county Portland metro area, thanks for chiming in. This is largely to you so that we can outreach this information um, to those that are affected uh, from this beetle. All right, so now I'm gonna launch into the Japanese beetle in general. It's native to Japan, hence the name. It is a generalist feeder that feeds on about 300 plus plants. I'll give you a little bit more detail on the plants later on. It was first found on the East Coast in the early 1900s, about 1906 on the East Coast. And it increased with population with a lawn culture because the grubs, the larvae, feed on the roots of grass. And that was largely in 1950s and 1960s when the populations increased. So here in Oregon, ODA has been conducting early detection service surveillance for the last 35 years. And they've, been, they've had traps out at the Portland Air, airport since 2000. Um, they have caught insects in the traps, but not at any, um, any sort of size of in those traps until last year. So ODA has been working on this and has been monitoring this insect. Last year, last summer, they trapped 369 of the Japanese beetle in a hot spot in Northwest Portland that Heather is gonna talk about more in more detail. So that's kind of where the eradication started. Um, and then Heather will tell you more about that later. All right, identification. So these guys, they are oval shape. They are scarab beetles. So they're similarly related to our, what we call June bugs here in Oregon. Um, they are about three eighths of an inch long. They have this dark 
green metallic head and kind of shoulder area, as you can see in the drawing. And then they have a tan metallic elytra. So the elytra, again, is the, four, the hardened forewing on the insect. And the other thing that you can tell is it's got tufts on its abdomen. Um, I'll show you a real life picture of it next slide. Um, and they're very strong flyers. So you may see them around. However, if they are flying in your garden, it does not necessarily mean that there's an infestation in your garden. It does, um, since they are strong flyers, they may have come from other places. So here is a picture of uh, the beetle, the adult. You'll see the green metallic uh, head and shoulders. You'll see the tan metallic elytra, and you see those white tufts poking out there at the bottom of the, the elytra. All right, the larva then, they are C-shaped scarab beetle larva. They're creamy, almost translucent. You can almost see inside of them. Um, kind of nondescript scarab beetle, most scarab beetle larva look like this. Uh, they have three legs near their head is the other identifying um, characteristic. And a picture of it is right here. You'll see by the tail, you can almost see through it. All right, the life cycle. So this is an image of the life cycle. Right now we're in September. So you'll see that the larvae are in the soil. They're about their first, maybe second instar larva. Um, they're pretty close to the top of the surface of the soil, and they will move deeper into the soil as the winter progresses and continue to feed on roots, grass roots, um, until they pupate in May and emerge as adults in early June and July. So we're also still trying to figure out what the general life cycle is of these insects. Um, they do, the females do lay 40 to 60 eggs over a two to three week time frame in the summer. They're, you, as you can see in the image, July, around July. Um, they overwinter, as I said, as grubs deeper in the soil, and then they move closer to the, so the surface in the fall and the spring. Um, and the, the adult females, they actually prefer to lay eggs in warm, slightly moist soil with lots of organic matter. So again, think about how much organic matter that we have in our soils and um, that we, we like to add organic matter to our soils. So that could have an effect on it. So the life cycle in Oregon, so this is some of the data from ODA. Um, the emergence was the week of June 18th, so you'll see that adult um, that's emerging out of the soil. That was when the, the adult emergence was detected. And the peak flight, so the most amount of insects that were tra trapped in the traps were around the week of July 5th, so they were very active around that time. And ODA, uh, was we're grateful that ODA was able to share with us some of the information. You can see those three peaks. The one peak around um, the emergence, actually, when they first started to emerge around the June 18th. You can see the numbers are pretty low and then rising after that. You can see the biggest peak with 539 in the trap, and that's the July 9th, July 5th week. Um, <clears throat> all right. So Japanese beetle damage, um, they do have mandibles. They are, um, they are chewing insects. So as adults and larvae, they will be chewing on both of the what they're feeding on um, they do really like roses unfortunately for portland and so that's one thing to be aware of this is japanese beetle that is feeding on a rose you'll see how it's got the chew marks all around it here is it it's feeding on a leaf and again it puts holes in it almost giving it a lacing effect 
here's a bigger picture of the damage that it can cause on a rose bush. And then on the larva, what they will do is they eat the, the roots of the grass and weaken the grass. So what, it, what happens is it actually kills the grass as um, the grass is not able to sustain that sort of damage. And the last thing I'm gonna finish with is those plants that are susceptible, so those that the Japanese beetle like to eat. Um, you have apples and crab apples. They um, feed on grapes and roses. Black walnuts, wisteria, our linden trees. You'll see there's a linden tree. The second um, tree on the left is it's, it's almost completely destroyed. Japanese maple and our stone fruits like plum, apricot, cherry, and peaches. But I will end on good news that there are plants that are resistant or unattractive to the Japanese beetle like boxwood, dogwood, burning bush, forsythia, spruce, pine, lilac, some juniper and arborvita, hemlock, redbud, and tulip poplar. And that's what I got. So um, before we switch over and have Heather um, talk, there are a couple questions, and maybe Heather, you're going to get to this, but um, people really don't know where the quarantine area is in Portland. That's going to be Heather is going to is going to cover that part. Okay, so we'll hold tight onto those. So there's a couple questions on that, um, and one question that came to my mind was when you were showing that turf grass where it was damaged. Would you then maybe see more mammal, potential for mammal damage, you know, like skunks or raccoons maybe going for the grubs? It's possible. It is possible that it could bring in some of those more omnivorous or carnivorous um, rodents or other animals like that. Um, they, when, especially when they're closer to the surface uh, in the spring, in the fall, they're easier to get. I think that they dig pretty far down in the winter time, so they're not as accessible of a food source, but they could have the potential to be a food source for other wildlife. Excellent. All right, so we're going to um, just take a second here and let uh, Rachel stop sharing her screen and then have Heather share hers. Heather, if you just want to be sure to unmute yourself. So now that you're sharing your screen, Heather, okay. it would have, right. oh, you got it? Okay. Sorry, yeah, I had to figure out where the bar was. To yeah, it kind of moves so, yes, around. Here I am. <laughs> so well, I'm going to start with a polling question here. Um, my question to you is, have you seen the Japanese beetle in the landscape before? A would be, or the first option is yes within Oregon. The next is yes in another state. And the third is no, I have never seen Japanese beetle live. The results are 14% of you have seen um, Japanese beetle in Oregon before. 32% have seen Japanese beetle in another state. And then 55% have never seen Japanese beetle. So we're about half and half. So that is good for me to know. I'm gonna move a little bit into monitoring here. So it's a little good to know who, um, how many of you are familiar with what the Japanese beetle looks like. So um, as you saw before, there, here's a photo of um, the Japanese beetle larvae. So we're gonna start with talking about monitoring for the larvae. And as Rachel was just mentioning, the larvae are gonna be feeding on turf, so you can look for dead patches of grass. And the grubs are actually going to be found in adjacent, the adjacent healthy lawn where the, lawn where the two areas are bordering each other. So where the healthy lawn meets the um, dead lawn is where you, where you can find them. And again, as Rachel mentioned, certain times of the year, they're gonna be easier to find than others. So either in the fall, they're gonna be probably too small perhaps to find, 
in the winter time, they may be too deep into the soil, but at the same time too with our water tables here in Oregon, it's a little bit hard to know maybe how deep they would go into the soil profile. And then um, in the spring, they're probably most easy to find. Uh, one thing to note, if you're looking at the turf and you notice that there's some issues with your turf, you know, it might be not hard to note is this actually from beetle feeding or is this maybe from a disease or something else that you're noticing on thrifty lawn? But if you were to kind of roll back your um, turf that's looking unhealthy, you can actually kind of expose a last lack of roots, which you wouldn't necessarily see with disease. Um, and the question that Brooke had answered or had asked earlier and Rachel had answered very nicely was wildlife can be, be observed digging up grubs. So um, raccoons, skunks, and also a number of birds do really like to eat Japanese beetle grubs. So you might just notice digging in the lawn more than you would notice um, some dead turf because it does take about 10 to 12 grubs per square foot to cause turf dieback. For adults, they are relatively easy to find, I would say, compared to some other insects. They like to congregate together or aggregate in a group. And a lot of this is due to the fact that when they feed on host plants, the host plant or the plants that they're feeding upon often have a re uh, chemical that they'll release once they're being attacked and that is very attractive to the Japanese beetle. And so they will smell that and they'll all come into a group and then start feeding on like this rose, for example, in this lower corner here. Um, and they're also found on the upper area of the leaves. They're not gonna be hiding underneath or in stems once they're in the adult stage. So they can be pretty easy to find. And also they're most active during the part of the day where you may be out in your garden um, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. when full suns, so they kind of like, they like more nice weather. And then they can, their damage is also pretty evident with the skeletonization um, that you see here and it's there aren't really a lot of insects in Oregon that's going to do a lot of widespread skeletonization like that so the damage can be fairly obvious. Another thing that I want to state is that some plants are more attractive to the Japanese beetle than others. I've read that the members of the smartweed smart weed family, buckwheat family, are attractive like Persicaria. I don't know how common these are in, in everyday lawns, but roses, for example, or grapes could also be an indicator plant because those are favorites of the Japanese beetle. So I wanna move on a little bit now that you know what to look for and you know the biology of the insect, a little bit about prevention of this pest. And as of course we've mentioned, there's already a population up in Portland. We wanna be able to keep this population from spreading and then just think in general about invasive insects and not spreading invasive insects. So the infestation that we have in Portland currently is due to somebody moving to Oregon from out of state and bringing their plants with them. So it could have been something on their patio, they had larvae of Japanese beetle in these plants, they moved to Oregon, put them outside on their patio again in their new home, and then now Japanese beetle is found um, at thousands of homes in a specific location. So we want to make sure that um, it, as individuals we're cautious about this, just the fact that this is how Japanese beetle can be moved is with soil. So one thing to think about is as master gardeners, we love to share plants. We have many plant sales. So if you're in the quarantine area, absolutely do not share any plants. I'm gonna talk a little, I'll show a map a little bit later on about where the quarantine area it may be spreading to next year. So it's going to be growing based on the trapping results. So if you're anywhere near the infestation area next year, you know, you, you may already have the eggs and larvae of Japanese beetle on your property. So you may not want, you're not gonna to wanna to share plants if you're in that area at all. And even if you're not in the quarantine area, it's something to think about in the future is that the ODA has reported that about there's seven to nine exotic introductions per year of, in, of pests or of, of different types of organisms that don't belong here. And um, for example, jumping worm is something new and Rachel talked about brown marmorated stink bug. Not all of these move in soil, but plants and, and trade and that sort of thing is, is certainly an issue. Also plant sales, like I said, you is 
if you're in the quarantine area, absolutely you don't want to be dividing, taking divisions and bring it to the plant sale or anything like that. If you're outside of the, the quarantine area, like I'm in Yamhill County, for example, we're not really that far away. It's a good thing for us to start thinking about in the future, perhaps having plant divisions may not be the best way to have plants at our plant sale. Maybe, you know, for a lot of master gardeners, obviously are very skilled and doing perhaps more seedling propagation, that sort of thing may be a better way to go. Um, the other thing that I want to just say is that um, the ODA likes to um, recommend that you do get an ODA temporary nursery license for plant sales. It just kind of helps them know what's going on. Um, so these are just some really good things to think about as master gardeners. Another way that Japanese beetles are moved around is on yard debris. So things like grass clippings as they're coming out of turf, um, sod, obviously there's roots involved there, plant material with soil, if you have um, yard trimmings you know, from your trees and shrubs and that sort of thing, you wanna make sure that you're thinking about this as a potential way for this pest to be spread. If you're in the quarantine area, you've probably seen this flyer before, and this tells you the importance of yard debris and the spread of this pest, and they, the ODA has special instructions for those that are in the quarantine area. For those that are, they need to use their curbside bin to actually dispose of all lawn waste. Anytime you cut the lawn, um, do yard trimmings, that sort of thing, they need to go into the bin that goes and is deep buried in the landfill. So that's how much of a risk that this is. And then landscapers are a really important part of this. And the ODA is really concerned about this aspect of um, this management program because there, there's, there can be some issues with communicating all this information to landscapers. So if you're in the quarantine area, your landscaper needs to be disposing of this material in a specialized place. They can't take it off site because this is a way that this um, insect is being spread. So one thought that um, is, is currently happening is thinking about lawn irrigation potentially is, it has an effect on Japanese beetle for sure. Can it be used in prevention? Maybe, maybe not. And so Japanese beetles really prefer to lay their eggs in moist, warm soil or in a, in a typically a turf area. And so, if you do not irrigate your lawn, especially if you're in the quarantine area, um, there's gonna be less space for the Japanese beetles that's attractive for them to lay their eggs. And the good thing about the quarantine area is that the ODA then is treating the other irrigated lawns in the area with insecticide. And so the Japanese beetles, if they do lay their eggs in insecticide area with an irrigated lawn, then those, um, larvae then will, will perish as they, as they start to feed. And if you don't have lawn irrigation, then the small instar larvae will actually perish as they hatch because the lawn is too dry and they'll desiccate. If you're outside the quarantine area, you know, it's not real apparent if this would make any, in, any difference at all once, if the Japanese be beetle were to establish here in Oregon, because if you had neighbors that were irrigating, the Japanese beetle could just go there, lay their eggs, and then come to your lawn to feed. So, but it is interesting. It's something the ODA is going to investigate more over the winter based on some of the data they've gotten is, you know, what is the role of um, our summer drought and a lack of irrigation on lawns with the Japanese beetle. So if you are out of the state of Oregon, you're probably aware that there are um, uh, multiple ways that you can manage Japanese beetle and I'm not going to go into any great depths about it today because I want to talk more about prevention, but there are um, biological control methods such as um, like there's a milky spore bacterial disease, there's um, nematodes that can be drenched, for example, um, there's chemical treatments for the larvae and for the adults, and then cultural management, which Rachel brought up a little bit, things like choosing um, species for your garden that the Japanese beetle do not prefer. The one thing I'd like to say about this is that I was just visiting family in Minnesota in the Twin Cities where the Japanese beetle is established. And even those that were doing some treatments for the Japanese beetle, the beetle is really prolific and it's hard to completely manage this insect. And so 
don't feel like if this insect gets established that we can just, you know, do a couple sprays and it'll all be fine. This will, this insect will definitely have a major impact on our state. So if you are in Oregon and you are outside of the quarantine area, you'll need to make sure that you report your sightings to the ODA for the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And I'll have contact information for them later on in the presentation. So this is a place where master gardeners can really have an active role in helping to help prevent the spread of this insect and help us be on the, on the forefront of what's going on. If you are in the quarantine area and you see that you have Japanese beetles in your in your garden and you don't want them there. The ODA does not want you to do any additional treatments beyond what they're doing. So they request that you just take um, a bucket of soapy water and you can just kind of knock the Japanese beetles into the soapy water and then dispose of them you know, in the garbage. They, um, they tend to kind of knock off relatively easily. If you, if you just hit them, they kind of like to just fall. So here's a little bit of information. There are some questions earlier, Brooke had said about the location of the outbreak. And so, I don't know if you can all see my cursor here, but there's that little um, reddish um, pointer there. So Southwest Portland is where the Cedar Mill area of Portland is. So it's just north of Beaverton, just north of Highway 26. And on the right hand side is a photo uh, or a screenshot that was taken of the original infestation in 2016 where the 369 beetles were caught. So it was a pretty contained area more or less with relatively small catch numbers and um, so based on this information the ODA set up a quarantine area and um, they set up some traps prior to the flights in the spring and they placed them next to host plants such as grapes or roses. So here on the left is a photo of one of the Japanese beetle traps and inside, um, there's these two kind of rubbery looking um, terracotta cover colored lures. So one is a synthetically derived sex pheromone lure and the other is a floral food lure. And so these are placed in each of the trap in the quarantine area and then all, also in other areas of the state to monitor for the Japanese beetle adults. So those that were in the quarantine area um, they had the product named Acelaprin applied in a granular form to irrigated turf um, in the spring of 2017. And this was done to over 2,000 properties in Washington County, and this totaled an area of about 1,000 acres. Um, Acelaprin is a reduced risk product, and it has low mammalian toxicity, which is the reason why the ODA decided to go with this product. It is very effective, and it has low um, mammalian toxicity. Um, the product was irrigated in and it takes 90 days to be effective. So what that means is that those Japanese beetle adults that were seen this summer in the area, those will not be effective. It's the larvae that are produced from their eggs that they laid this summer. So um, as the grubs this fall start feeding, they're going to take in the insecticide and then next summer, the thought is that there'll be less Japanese beetle as a result. Um, and then also there's going to be applications required in the following years as well. So the ODA is going to keep on this project. So here's a image of the um, treatment area in a map. And I'm going to maybe start out by telling you a little bit about the key and what all these different circles and everything are that are on here. So all the little light blue circles these are all Japanese beetle traps, but those that are negative, so there weren't any Japanese beetles found in there. All the smaller kind of pink, light pink are smaller trap counts. And then as the colors get darker red, that means there's more insect or more Japanese, Japanese beetle found within those traps. The blue area that's found around this main circle, and you can't see all of it quite in this screenshot, but that is the actual quarantine area. So those dots that you're seeing that are pink or red that are outside the quarantine area, those are um, Japanese beetle traps that have caught Japanese beetle outside of the quarantine area. The other thing I wanna state is that the um, airport is not on this map. The airport also has traps that caught Japanese beetle coming in on air cargo, just as has happened many other years. 
Um, also, I want to point out that along Highway 26, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of beetles that were found, as well as in parks and green spaces. And so it's thought at this time, and the ODA is going to do some work over the winter to try and look at this and figure it out a little bit more. But it's thought that the movement of the Japanese beetle outside the quarantine area is likely more related to hitchhiking of this insect more so than it flying. So the Japanese beetle is a very strong flyer and has the capability to fly longer distances, but um, it's thought that in this case, a lot of these, based on the location of some of these outer traps, it's probably more from being on um, lawn mowers or different equipment or riding with lawn debris. Um, and then the other thing, I don't, like I said, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I have, there's a spot kind of over by the legend over in Hillsboro that has kind of a cluster of spots over on the left. And this is from the green waste facility where a lot of lawn waste is being taken to. The other thing I want to comment on is my bullet point at the top about in early August, about 12,000 Japanese beetle had been trapped. And so this is when this map is from. This is the latest available map on the website. And so at that time, that is accurate that 12,000 Japanese beetles were trapped. Unfortunately, um, I had a conversation with Clint Burfitt, who's um, the Insect Pest Prevention and Management Program Manager, and he told me that the um, more recent numbers are probably going to be closer to 20 to maybe even 25,000 beetles are going to be trapped this summer. Again, most of them are within the treatment area, so that's the good news is that they're not necessarily moving a large distance outside that, but um, there's probably going to be an extension of where the quarantine area is next year. So this is a um, closer view of the map from before. So you can see the actual quarantine area, some spots around it, like I said, probably going to be added to a quarantine area next year. And then I also wanted to point out the center of the quarantine area with the darker circles. There's one trap within there that had about 4,000 beetles trapped this last summer. So that's about a fifth of the total of the beetles that were found. So there's really definitely a hot spot in the center of that area. So as a response to what has been found this summer, because they did find um, more, more Japanese beetle than they were expecting. I mean, they were planning on having a five-year response plan earlier, but um, as a result of this summer, it's likely that, as I said, they're probably going to be expanding the treatment and quarantine boundary to maybe in the realm of 50% of what it is now. Um, really important is community engagement. They had very good community engagement this last summer and spring with those most, almost everybody was willing to cooperate with the quarantines and the treatments. So if you're nearby the quarantine area, perhaps you may be included in it this year if you were not already this year. And um, it's, it's really important for individuals to cooperate with this because it's, it's this, these treatments are, and the landscaping moving, you know, not moving the landscaping debris. This is what stands between um, a small area having the Japanese beetle and it being eradicated or it being spread throughout the entire state. So cooperation is really important as well as um, making sure you're, um, collaborating with your landscaping companies. If you're in the quarantine area, make sure that they know what to do with landscaping waste. Or if you're master gardeners, make sure, and you're in the in um, Washington County or in the Portland area, you know, making, if you're um, communicating with people about this pest, you know, make sure you communicate the importance as well of um, communicating with landscapers and green waste. So some of the things I already discussed, kind of wrapping things up here, is that moving plant material and debris is what's going to be spreading this pest. Don't share plants in the quarantine area or nearby. Now that you've kind of seen the map and see there's a lot of red spots out there with beetles that have been attracted to the traps. Another thing to note is that the traps obviously aren't um, capturing all the Japanese beetle out there. So just because you see one or two in those traps, there's a whole lot more that are out there that probably aren't being captured. So you know, just keep that in mind if you're nearby the area. Um, and as I said, landscaping waste must be disposed of properly. 
So in conclusion, this is a pest we do not want to establish in Oregon. I have <laughs> this photo in here of this gentleman up on the right, and he works at a nursery in the Midwest, and this is a bag of beetles that he has collected from 20 traps in a three-day period. And so this insect has the potential to cause a huge impact economically and otherwise in the state. It's estimated that this pest, if it were to establish in Oregon, could cost the nursery industry up to $17 million a year. The wine grape industry, $43 million a year. So this, isn't, this is something we really want to make sure we're trying to prevent. Um, you can see the photo I have here of an apple tree completely skeletonized, and this is from, um, from Minnesota. And so it's not only affecting homeowners, but orchards and commercial crops as well. Um, so prevention is really important, making sure it's not spreading any further than it is. And master gardeners can really have a key role in this. There is a new infestation that I was told about recently south of Eugene. And somebody had moved from Arkansas, I believe, to this area. Um, and brought some plants with them, brought the Japanese beetle, and there was a master gardener nearby in the neighborhood, and the Japanese beetle from this other person was attracted to their wonderful garden, and they were able to report this, um, this Japanese beetle adult to the ODA, and the ODA is able to go in and treat early for this pest and catch it right away. And so having master gardeners who know what this pest looks like, they know the importance of catching it early, is really important and all the interaction that you have with the public at desk clinics and with different educational events that you do, you really have, um, can play a key role in making sure that we don't have this pest established. So for the contact information for the Oregon Department of Agriculture, there's an email address um, there and phone number. And the other thing I wanna point out is that there's this website, JapaneseBeetlePDX.info and this has a lot of really good information about um, the, the pest in general, um, what, about its biology, about the eradication procedures that are happening in Portland right now. If you wanna know more about the chemical that's being used or you wanna know, um, you know what are, how about landscaping waste and where does it go? A lot of this information can be found at this Japanese Beetle PDX info site. So with that, um, I will accept questions. And I also want to state as well um, that we also, as, as, uh, as Brooke said, that we also have an extension publication about the Japanese beetle that you can also um, refer to. It's in the OSU extension catalog. All right, so um, I was just putting a few of those links into the chat, um, and then they'll, we'll also send them out in an email so that you have um, that information and uh, the extension learn page that you went to to register for this. That will also get updated and include these links so you can have that um, information. That's a great picture, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this was taken at the Minnesota State Fair, and yeah, I, I just had to. I, I just had to take it. <laughs> Good entomologist. <laughs> I thought this is perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm sure people are going to be typing questions, but we do have a few that have come through. Um, two of them are asking about composting, and so maybe either of you, I know Rachel, you had mentioned that um, they're attracted to organic matter, and so could one of you touch on the role that composting, home composting, and, and all of that might play into um, Japanese beetles? Heather, can you answer this one? Sure, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I don't, okay. you know, in, in the information that I have looked at in order to prepare the presentation and in our publication, I didn't come across anything that specifically addressed composting. I'm, I guess, you know, if you're hot composting, I mean, you could, you know, if you're taking yard debris and you want to compost your yard debris and use it and spread it um, in your yard, if you're hot composting, you know, it, you could potentially kill the beetle. The one thing I'd want to say, I guess, if you're trying to make your, if you were making your own compost, is that you don't want to 
spread it anywhere. You know, so if you're in the quarantine area and you want to take your yard debris and, and compost it, you know, and then use it on your own yard, I, th that, I think that would be fine whether or not you, you know, end up killing the beetles through your composting process or not. But you definitely don't want to take that then compost and move it to your mother's house to help her out or something like that. I would just say anything that came from your yard debris within the quarantine area, don't, don't spread it. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Um, uh, Carmen had a question asking about the, the summer being so hot and dry, and this maybe goes back to the biology of the insect. Um, do they know the effect that, you know, different weather conditions have on uh, population numbers of the beetle? Yeah, I don't, I was, unless Rachel I can maybe address it and you want to add something else, you certainly can. I was going to say, I don't know if it, I mean, this pest is established as well in other, you know, warm places. You know, if you think of the southeast, if you look at, think about the map that Rachel showed before. So I don't know if the heat in itself necessarily is going to negatively affect them, but I'm not, I'm not positive. And, you know, this pest is brand new to the state, so I think it's not completely understood yet what effect it's going to have. Like I said, the dry, however, is more likely to have an effect. You know, there are summer droughts and long, long durations without water, but, you know, I think of all the commercial businesses that have irrigated turf and homeowners that have irrigated turf. So, you know, potentially if you're a landowner with a lot of land and none of it is irrigated, you know, that, that could potentially you know, have, have an effect on the Japanese beetle, but I think that they have probably enough reservoirs of irrigated turf for them to travel around to, being that they're strong flyers. But at this point in time, as I said, they're all kind of sticking to, they're sticking closer to the quarantine area because I think they're not, they're not needing to really move out to um, look for food at this time. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question. I mean, in a way we don't really know, but I don't know if the temperature is going to affect them as much as maybe the drought, but at the same time, they can find places that are irrigated to lay their eggs. So I think that I would just add that the only thing that I can really think about for temperature is that it would change the life. It might change the life cycle. So it might change when they lay their eggs and depending on when the fall rains come in Oregon, like right now, um, it, it might have an effect, but like Heather said, we really don't know much about its life cycle. We're just starting to track it now. Yeah, no, it's a great addition. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of research to be done. Um, so Valerie has a question about, um, I think it's kind of maybe getting at biocontrol. So, um, so Japanese beetles, assuming they're from Japan and that maybe where they're originally from, maybe there's um, some different interactions. So how do gardeners where the Japanese beetle is native, how do they manage this pest or is it, is it kept in balance in their ecosystem and maybe yeah, something for future? I would just say that like most non-native invasive species in their home, um, their homeland, there are checks in the ecosystem, whether it's diseases, it's parasitoids, or it's, um, you know, some other type of predator. I don't, Heather, do you know the specifics on the biocontrols of the Japanese beetle? I am unaware of any particular parasitoids or predators that are um, in going to be brought over to the states uh, um, and so I don't know if that is going that type of biological control is going to happen here um, but I don't know Heather if you have more to add to that. Yeah I was going to say I did have a conversation with Clint Burfitt and he did say that they were going to be doing some investigation of some potential biocontrol agents. I believe there was a fly and a wasp potentially that they were going to be looking at. Um, I don't know how much it's going to be helping with this current infestation because, you know, they need to put it in the quarantine facility and, you know, figure out more about the different biocontrol agents. Um, they're thinking about it maybe potentially for, you know, 
releasing and keeping it at places like the airport where, where there's, you know, kind of constant infestations from out of state. So like I said, I don't know a ton of details about it, but it's something that the ODA is, is looking into. And a lot of times with those biological controls that come from the native homeland, there's a, a lengthy process that needs to be done um, with research to see what the impact of those native parasitoids or predators to the homeland would do to our native populations. And so um, there is a, a lengthy quarantine for anything that we bring over here that might try to combat non-native uh, non invasives. All right, um, we have two questions that are a, a little bit similar. So let me scroll up here, sorry. Um, so Karen wants to know, you know, there's a lot of garden shows and orchid shows that come through and people are bringing plants and then homeowners will go and purchase these plants and bring them home. Um, so she wants to know if those are safe. So maybe the sort of regulation of that. And it may also play into, um, a question that Joanne has about um, she's from Central Oregon and she's coming to a nursery in Portland. Um, does she need to be concerned? So I don't know if either of you can touch on maybe some of the um, inspection regulations that happen in Oregon. Yeah, I mean, I can maybe address it to, you know, peripherally a little bit, but yes, I mean, I guess the good thing about buying from nurseries is that they are going to be regulated by the ODA and they're going to be having inspections, especially if they're within the quarantine area, you know, that obviously is, is going to be a major issue that the ODA is working with. Um, but they're going to be looking as well at, at nurseries nearby. Um, I would say it's much safer to be buying your plant material from a nursery than from someplace else because at least the you know the regulatory um, stance is there and they're being regulated so um, you know I guess it's it's something to think about if you're you know you if you're buying plant material but there is you know nurseries do need to go through a lot of um, a lot of regulatory techniques in terms of, you know, if they did have the Japanese beetle, they would need to, and they were on to ship to areas that do not have the Japanese beetle, there's absolutely regulations um, that they need to, you know, drench with insecticides or spray with insecticides. So if it is known that a nursery has it, absolutely, they're going to have to do something to treat for it. Um, there's actually a second half to Joanne's question, which I thought was interesting because we have folks from across the state on and um, so she's in Central Oregon and she uh, is questioning on the on the biology. So they get much colder winters. And so Rachel, you were saying, you know, the, the grubs are moving down lower as it gets colder. Do, is that going to maybe just sort of self limit the beetle from potentially establishing in areas with colder winters? Um, I don't necessarily think so because um, it is pretty well established in the Northeast where there is a lengthy winter, cold winter season. Um, I think that they get far enough in the ground that they are protected. Um, and so, again, we don't necessarily know how it would spread in our state um, and what it would do and the differences between the western and the eastern side, um, which is one of the reasons why we're trying to eradicate it before it moves over there. But I would be very cautious about, um, again, like Heather said, purchasing from places that are within the quarantine um, and, um, and making sure that you're, if you are purchasing from the Portland area from a reputable nursery. Um, Sandra wants to know, and, and this may come back to where Heather was talking about how Master Gardeners, we have plant sales where maybe people are, are digging and dividing plants. Um, what would happen if the roots were washed and there was, um, you know, maybe no soil clinging to the roots um, or if there was an insecticide treatment on that? Would that be, is there any research, I guess, into that as a m method of preventing the spread of this beetle? Well, there, like I said, there, 
there are obviously nurseries throughout the country that do have this pest and they do ship to um, locations where the pest does not exist. Having plants with soil though, I mean, it's, it is a risk and they're gonna be doing treatments, you know, drenches of insecticides and that sort of thing um, to lessen the risk of shipping, of shipping the pest with insects. Um, certainly, you know, washing the roots off and that sort of thing, it, 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 or spraying an insecticide, it can, you know, it can be helpful. But at the same time, I would, I would still encourage at this point in time in Portland, not just not doing it and avoiding it. Yeah, and the, and the nurseries, they use different uh, chemistries that right. we might not even have available exactly. too. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, two questions on trapping, and I know you're not, you know, with, with ODA. Um, so Sandra has said that she has seen green uh, ODA label traps um, across the county, and she just wants to know, are they Japanese beetle traps, or maybe they're looking for some other uh, invasive pest? Um, and then she also would like to know if homeowners, should they put out their own traps? Are those available to um, monitor or try to reduce population? Sure. So I'm not positive if the green traps that you're finding are for sure the Japanese beetle traps. If they, I mean, I kind of showed you some photos earlier of what they look like if you're, so they very well could be the Japanese beetle traps that you're seeing. Um, it is not encouraged actually that you put traps in your own property, um, especially as a management tool because they actually are, I mean, they're meant to be attractive to the beetles. So if you, for example, had Japanese beetle and it was established in your area and you put the traps in your yard, you're actually going to have more Japanese beetle than you would otherwise. So it's not really meant for them to be used as a management technique. It's more for monitoring. And I would not, you know, even, I wouldn't add Japanese beetle traps either because the ODA, you know, they have their grid of what they're doing. And I think it's best to just let them take care of the monitoring at this point in time with the traps at least. However, if you're, you know, noticing Japanese beetle in your landscape on your plants and you're not in the quarantine area, absolutely let them know. But I don't think you need to, I think it's best to not take on the trapping on your own. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more questions. So, um, has there actually been any successes? So we have two, so Skip and uh, Sandra, they both wanna know is there, are there other areas in the United States where people actually have had success at doing this eradication? Give us positive hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, Rachel, if you wanna address this or else I have some thoughts as well. But If you have some thoughts, go for it. Okay, uh, so, oh, so I was gonna say, I think that there have been Others, I mean, I think even within Oregon, there's been a um, infestation or two that, but it's been much smaller that has been eradicated. So I wouldn't feel, you know, that it's, <laughs> that it's hopeless or anything at this point in time. I mean, the ODA is going to continue on with what they're doing. Um, it's certainly, you know, more beetles than they're expecting to see this summer. But I mean, I think it's still possible to eradicate the pest and there have as far as I know, I believe there have been other small eradications that have happened in other locations. Great, um, and then just uh, one more question I think that we can answer live here. Um, you had displayed a list of um, plants that were susceptible and some that were not as attractive to the Japanese beetle. Um, do you know anything about hops? So someone was saying their hops plant uh, has a, similar type of skeletonizing appearance on the leaves. Is that one that you know of, or maybe we need to look that up and we can send it out? Um, I think it is. Heather, did you, would you agree with that one? I th I'm pretty sure that hops is on that list, but it wasn't on my list. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, it would be, have to be something that I look up. Um, I did see the second part of that question, if hops growers or other folks are involved in these efforts. Um, I know that ODA has contacted a number and had meetings with a number of stakeholders um, around the state 
to get them involved and knowledgeable. And I also want to just acknowledge ODA and um, Clint Burfitt. He has been our contact at ODA and has been really great working with us. He also worked on the publication with us that came out in April, and he's been a really um, a, a great cooperator with all of this information. Great. Um, we have just one last question, kind of a fun one, uh, wanting to know on uh, will moles, will they eat our Japanese beetle? I know over here in Western Oregon, we sure can have a lot of moles. Any, any research on that as a biocontrol? Um, yeah, I don't know, if Rachel, if you have more information on this. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Like I said, I looked, there was some information about some um, wildlife that will eat Japanese beetle. I don't know if, I, know, I didn't see moles on that list, but I didn't do any extensive research on it. So um, I guess I could say at this time, I'm thinking probably not, but I'm not going to rule it out for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, there's wishful thinking for that one, right? <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank both of our presenters. We have our next um, and the last one in the series is coming up on the status of boxwood blight. So tune back in Tuesday, October 3rd for that presentation. And real quick, I'll put a link in chat. So this learn event is the link I just put in chat is for this learning event. Again, all the links will update that uh, with links that were mentioned here as well as a link to the recording will be available there too. So feel free to share that with colleagues and friends who were not able to join us. Any closing thoughts? Nope. Okay, everyone have a great day. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye.